It's uh, Newland. Oh, right, 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 right. Bad, my bad, my bad. Right. So let me introduce the class again that we're going to first uh, talk about Sherlin, Sherwood Newland's interview with Chris, Christoph Tippett. He's a surgeon and he changed his mind. He had sort of a radical conversion, simply means turning around experience. We'll go through that. And then we have an article about revenge and we'll go through that one. And the overall theme of Krista Tippett's uh, website, she has a huge, huge, whatever it is, <laughs> where you, all you do is plug in www.onbeing.org. So she's been doing these interviews for something like 15 years. And she's got one posted for every week. And every single one is something to do with the relation between science, social science, and spirituality in some sense. So, um, so that's where we're at. And this class is very much about that. So go ahead, Mia. Okay, Newland, my bad, I mixed them up. But I liked, uh, one thing that I liked was that they talked about like whenever you paint, like became depressed. I, I don't know. First of all, they talked about depression, which was interesting to me because I just had this like no, like notion that like surgeons just that like I don't know. I just they're perfect, right? I don't know. I just it wasn't something that I ever really like expected. And then when I read it, I was like, whoa. But um, I liked how when he talked about how he became depressed. Um, it uh the specific quote was that he realized that uh. His religious beliefs were nothing more than uh, obsessional thinking. Like it was just something that he was like obsessing over, which I kind of thought was interesting. Um, like, I don't know when and then like this depression hit and it was like, wow, like I'm being punished. But then he realized that that's irrational and people are people and we go through things. And I don't know, I just kind of I thought that was interesting because it's so true. Like people will just obsess over like these specific like rules and laws of whoops. I don't know where I went. These like laws of religion, and there is there's always some sort of like satanic like purpose behind every little bad thing that you go through. But in reality, we're human, and we weren't created to be perfect. So I don't know. I liked that. I liked that that just that specific portion. Okay. Um, what about you, Alex? Turn on your mic. Um, I actually didn't do the reading. Um, because like, I don't, I no longer have the book, but I kind of remember a little bit from what I read. Um, you need to get the book though, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry, let me close my door really quick. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll do Jack at the minute. Okay, Jack. Um, I liked when it said, um, I can't remember which part, which article this was. I liked it. I liked when it said, um, the more we understand about the, the natural world, like uh, natural scientific discoveries, the more we understand about the mind of its maker. Okay. Um, which article was that? Was that Newland? I think so. Although, you know, there's other ones that weren't assigned for today. But was that Newland? What page was it on or whatever? Um, I believe 170. Yeah, that's for, you know, two months from now. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so did you look at the post? It says Sherwin Newland, and then it has Tippett, the personal virtues, and then it has, yeah, you, I mean, it's hard to get a conversation going when people aren't prepared. So right. just I'm try sorry. to try to get it right. So next time, next time you can, did you do the, the one on revenge? Yeah, I, I read that one. 
okay, good. Okay, so we'll hold off on the the spirit. Most of it I have mostly in chronological order, but not entirely. So, um, all right. So, Alex, what did you come up with? Um. So. So the the chapter was about like finding a balance between religion and um, like sciences and biology. Um, and I think that like argument goes all the way back into like, where did we evolve from? Or like the, 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 um, the issue of evolution. Um, and I think it's, it's necessary to like understand and not just believe in what is being told to us. Um, because I believe like God created this like universe in us for a reason. And um, Hi. Uh, oh yes, please, thank you. Okay. So sorry. Um, so to understand like what evolution was and, um, uh, and um, not just like look at a, like what like, uh, just listen to like what the the like not prophets or priests but like the 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 people who say whatever um, that evolution is not real or the, the, the scientific facts are not true because a book says something um, would take us away from God I believe. Okay, okay. Um, uh, let's see. What about you, Melanie? Um, so this is actually one of my favorite things that we've read so far. Um, just because I'm super kind of like spiritual, I guess you could say. And so this kind of like hit all hit all of that. Um, but I really liked when he said, be kind for everyone you meet is carrying a great burden. It helps explain so many things about others, just as it, just as it explains so much about yourself. And um, I don't know, I just think that's really important that resonates with me because I think if everyone in the world took the time to get to understand the person next to them and why they're thinking the way that they think, the world would just be such a better place <laughs> but unfortunately that doesn't happen and I think that's where like in politics sides start to get taken um just because we don't understand why everyone around us thinks the way that they do um so yeah yeah it would break down the polarization right and also why would somebody post something on social media Right, it's so impersonal. Is this? It's just. Yeah, I hate social media. <laughs> but you know how you create then a whole narrative of things you believe, and they're not connected to any person or anything. Um, it's it's intellectually dishonest. Does that make sense? Is yeah, there... I think a lot of times people. Um, post on social media because it's a way that they can get all of their thoughts out without someone else wanting to give their opinion, you know, before they finish. Um, and I think it just makes them kind of feel powerful in a way because they can say everything they want to say without the fear of backlash in person. <laughs> well, well, that's true. I mean, I understand that. It's just the other person shouldn't be doing that either, right? Um, they should be having a conversation. But okay, so so even though you didn't have the book, and even though um, you, you know, I really sort of handed you the thing you could, I have a cheat sheet, you know, I gave you a cheat sheet. So um, let's see. 
So I, the, I said, you know, the first two articles outlined in the attachment, the biology, the spirit, taking revenge and forgiveness, right? So I didn't give you the page numbers, but um, their page numbers are in here. So, uh, and then even if you didn't have the book, even if, you know, here's a whole bunch of quotes, like a cheat sheet that, so I think you could have come prepared. Does that make sense? Uh, that it wouldn't be too much to expect that people would have a lot to say, but so try to, you know, tough it up and um, come prepared. And if you have any questions, please just email me. Um, if you want office hours, you can just let me know when you want them because I'm around a lot. Uh, I just sometimes don't turn on the machine, don't turn on the Zoom, but um, I am very available. So, and I like to talk and I would love to have your questions. So, all right, so let's go through Newland um, just uh, some points that I thought were important. Um, he, so he he told this story about he was raised um, with in a very strict Orthodox Jewish family, and he had obsessional thinking, right? And so then he decided this God is just my father, right? I remember an interview with a guy who said, God walks around the living room with his underpants on, you know, I mean, as a kid, you get this huge God thing in your head. And then you realize all that is, is as far as you know, a bunch of words your parents made up just to sort of threaten you or make you feel guilty or make you behave. So then he became a complete atheist, right? And then he sort of comes back and he realizes as a surgeon, his job is to try and bring the body back to its natural health. And then it occurs to him, that's what religion is supposed to do, right? The religious teachings are actually promote flourishing and well being, you know, love each other as you love yourself makes for a much more balanced life and a much more flourishing life. He says our bodies really want to flourish and this stuff gets in the way, but religion shouldn't get in the way. That's, um, but he doesn't decide there is a God, he just leaves it. He just says, I'm not anti-religion like I used to be, right? Um, so our capacity for love, and then I'll ask you, I'll go through a few of these quotes, and then I'll ask you again, each of you to have a reaction, okay? Um, we have a drive to create balance and order, and this is evolutionary, but that isn't anti-God. Like if God created, a, created humanity or created the universe so that we would evolve, then we can actually have a science of medicine because we can understand cause and effect. If God just arbitrarily comes in there and decides who's sick and who's well, we would have no medicine. We would be completely helpless, but we're not, right? We have medicine and why does it work? Because of evolution. So then it's a more generous God to have us evolve and then be able to take care of ourselves than a God who just wants to do whatever he wants and have absolute power, right? That's a pretty cruel God. Um, so the first, the first point is it sounds a lot like Arist uh, Aristotle, right? Finding the mean between extremes. And he doesn't even think of Aristotle. It's just, we keep coming back to it. It's so interesting these interviews, lots of other Confucius, Buddha, they all come back to the same insight. And that's because it's based just on the human condition. They don't even know each other's already said this. 
Okay. Then he says, um, she says that his ideas could inform religious perspectives. They don't rule out the idea of a creator, but they don't require it, right? You could say that the world has just an inborn capacity to do this, to self-regulate, okay? And then I'll ask you about that. Um, in your own worldview, do you include the relation between biology? And that's what um, Alex was getting at. Um, then free will, is it possible to have too much guilt? And is it possible to have too much little guilt, right? So Aristotle says, good parents raise their children to actually take pleasure in virtue. So they don't need guilt to control their behavior, right? Um, then, is that too naive? Okay, and then what does our culture do? Does our culture promote uh, parenting that helps children take pleasure in virtue? Does the community reinforce that? Um, and that's, I think, at best, why people go to church, because then little kids see all these people relating and being virtuous and volunteering for stuff and getting along with each other. So they're sort of setting that pattern but it doesn't always work that way. It's just that um, it, that's how it's designed to be a community of people based on virtue, but it can turn into guilt, obviously. Um, so he talks about his upbringing as an Orthodox Jew, and then he changed his mind. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out, okay, as doctors, they don't create health, they just try to bring the body back to its natural system, right? Um, there's an imbalance, somebody's sick, and so they try to bring the body back into balance. And then Socrates talks about the corruption of the medical profession, that it can be motivated by money or status. And then you let people get sick so that you can get worshiped for getting them well whereas it's better just to prevent sickness in the first place. Um, okay, the words spirit or soul. So I will, I'll stop at this one and then we'll do two rounds. But what do you think when you, when you use the word spirit or the word soul? You could respond to that. You could respond to the art of medicine. How is that practiced in our society? And then evolution, and then do you think we're wired to flourish? Do you think if you raise a kid to take pleasure in virtue, that's really natural. That's not impossible. And it's not uh, arrogant, because then you don't depend on some God to believe in. Uh, or what do you think? How do you think a kid should be raised? All right, any of those questions you can respond to. So, uh, Jack. And turn on your cameras, if at all possible, really. I don't care if you're eating. I just want to see you. I want to see some eyeballs. Um, I'll respond to the first one. Uh, I read a quote, it said, uh, even the creationists have been liberated by Darwin's theory. I don't know if this was part of the article or not. But um, yeah, I think uh, God created us to flourish. And he's not really like a puppet master that pulls the strings. Okay. All right, so Alex. So um, I was thinking about the the spirit versus soul question, okay. but I don't think I can answer that. So I'm going to answer the same question as uh, Jack. Um, and I do think that we were created to flourish. Um, I don't remember where I read this or where the reading was from or if it was from this class, but I remember um, that 
there was there was a reading about a woman who had depression and because she had gone through depression she had she was able to feel the more positive emotions even more she was able to be thankful for it so I think that kind of relates to like like how like we are created to be to flourish but we aren't exempt from hardships um because God doesn't like hold us like in the reins we're not his little puppets and he can't protect us from all or any like uh mis misfortune because we were set free um and us going through the those hardships allow us to grow further and flourish more i think okay good um mia okay i is, is it okay if i answer a different question i want to answer the question about guilt oh yeah that's that's why i set them all out there okay i wasn't sure if we were doing them i was kind of confused about that okay um like the is it too is it possible to have like too much guilt or too little I mean I don't necessarily think so because I feel like everyone like as a I mean okay it depends on like as you, who you are as a person but everyone is kind of created differently so like how, how can you even define what too much is or too little is I mean there's like I don't know the only uh, uh la, 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 what's the word other oh girl losing your train of thought aren't you um like thing that I could think of that could have like make you have like too much guilt is if you had like severe anxiety or something which is like or like severe like OCD or something where it was like if I don't do this thing then like this Quit horrible it. thing and and then I don't know that's the only way otherwise like how, I think the question is like unanswerable because how can you define it I don't know Newland thought he grew up with too much guilt right <laughs> Yeah, I just don't understand that quote, uh, or like I don't, I don't get that either. I guess because like well, how. I think it like different kids respond to the same parents, right? Maybe the same rules, but children will respond differently. Is that true? Do you guys have siblings? And some siblings ignore what their parents say, and some maybe take it too seriously or something. I, I don't know. I think kids are different. Um, what about you, Melanie? What do you think? What, what, Mia? Oh, no. I was just saying, doesn't that... Wait, I'm confused. Sorry, I'm really confused at what's happening. Does that... Because wouldn't that also just be another thing of, like, this is how I was created? I don't know. Like, how we were created to, like, make you decide what you ignore and what you don't? Like... Okay. That's what you choice. Think. Isn't that a matter of choice? Or when kids, are you saying when kids are little, they don't have choice, they just imitate stuff? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. That's why I'm confused. I don't know. Well, there is that, that thing where parents try to habituate their children, right? Right. And then the children's character starts to form. And they're probably not that conscious, but they're, they do form differently. And so then at a certain point, they become aware that they have choice, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I just need to process for a second. I don't know. I'm just kind of, okay. I was talking to my grandson now. He's in seventh grade. And, I, and he went to a new school and I just keep telling him, well, now you have choice. Like you're becoming old enough so you can choose how to relate to people. You can choose. And then he has a little sister who's five years younger and he can understand that she's not aware of that, right? She just pretty much does what she's told and imitates, but he can separate himself and he can be more aware so, I mean, just to tell him that literally triggers that consciousness level where he actually does become more aware. Does that make sense? Because what is the teenage rebellion? Well, all it is is, gee, I don't have to do this, right? But 
really, it should just be that you're aware that you have choice. You don't have to rebel. You can choose, you know, how you're going to relate to your parents. Um, anyway, um, Melanie, what do you think? Um, well, building off of that conversation, I think that, you know, uh, until a certain age, like you were saying, um, your grandchildren, um, like up until a certain age, I think you do just kind of receive commands from your parents. Um, but then once you get to that age where you can make choices on your own, I think a lot of the choices that people make have to do with how they were raised and the parenting that they had. Um, but I also think it has a lot to do with like experience, just things that you've had to experience. I think that molds people a lot more than anything else. But that's why we have wisdom literature, right? That's why we have books and, and context so that it's more than just haphazard experience, right? And it's more than just how your parents happen to that. There's, you can step back and sort of see it in relationship to a standard, an objective standard. So in Arkansas, for example, people do not eat right. You know, they get habituated to eat wrong. They look at everybody else and they're all eating wrong. It's number one in obesity. So that doesn't make you make it so you don't have any choice. It's just that you have to stand back. You have to get an education. You have to have somebody or some book, something has to make you aware that there's an, a standard against which you can evaluate what's in front of you. And that's why I like college. That's where you really get a chance to do that. Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes. Yeah, well, that's the whole point of taking you away from your family and bringing you here and putting you, you know, rooming or being around people that are as much different as we can possibly dredge up is so you become aware that so much of what you thought was natural is really cultural. Somebody chose to train you that way or to think that way. It's not given. And so then you have to rethink everything. I remember uh, Minnesota, especially where I grew up and my family and all that was really different from Arkansas, from Batesville. So over and over and over again, I, I had this heightened awareness that, oh, you know, some people really don't agree with that at all, right? And so all of a sudden I became aware of how powerful culture is. And I do hope that you, you keep that in mind um, throughout your college career, because right now, you know, we have a pretty unlivable culture, and I don't think you really want that uh, in the future. All right, so then you can keep in mind the difference between spirit and soul. Um, and then that idea of being kind for everyone is carrying a burden. So really, honestly, I think the fact that we've been at war for 20 years, I think there are a number of people who act out who really have various levels of PTSD because we have such a huge percentage of our population that's been exposed to violence, to war or to um, sexual assault or to all sorts of violence where, you know, we have a lot of violence in our society. And so, you know, they're traumatized. There's a lot of people who are just literally traumatized. Um, but then there's just, uh, you know, especially now with COVID and people are under stress. So I wanna, I really wanna come across as a teacher who doesn't want to make your life any more stressful but you do have to come prepared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm not going to threaten you. I just, uh, you know, like to have a good class. Um, and then the things, another thing that I realized late in life that nobody told me 
is when you are feeling the most isolated, when you are having these emotions that you think nobody's ever had this before, that's exactly the most universal, right? And that's what the wisdom literature is about. But um, going through puberty, for example, I remember, especially my son, the expression on his face was just kind of like he got hit in the back of the head with a brick, you know, like nobody's been through this before. <laughs> or you fall in love or you in, are in love with your baby when it's born. Honestly, it's this huge rush and you just think nobody, nobody else has had this or depression. So um, I do think education really helps because you can say, oh, this is what it means to be a human being. You know, it's not just about me. Um, and then his conclusion is that what's needed between science and religion is a conversation. And then you could uh, mention, do virtues and vices affect our social and political life? So um, any other final comments about this article? I don't know where Mia went. Okay. All right. Anybody else? So, so that's, that's to keep that in your mind, that actually by nature, we're intended to flourish and a good Christian parent would teach their kid to love virtue and not play on guilt. Um, okay. So the next point is revenge. And this is the story of Bud Welch and his daughter, the Oklahoma bombing. I don't know if you know about that. It was a long time ago now. The Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, Tim McVeigh was anti-government. And so he drove a truck with a huge bomb in it underneath his building, government building. It blew up, the building collapsed, this whole daycare center full of little kids, they all died. Um, and so Bud Welch wanted to take revenge, right? He just wanted the guy to fry, right? I just want him to fry. I don't care, I don't wanna, um, I don't want a trial, just kill him. And then he met Tim McVeigh's father. And he realized, you know, there was a picture of him playing baseball. And he just realized, you know, that guy loved his son as much as I loved my daughter. And killing one more person doesn't help anybody. So this, the person being interviewed, McCullough, argues that we're hardwired, right? We're hardwired both for revenge and for forgiveness. So if you ever hear somebody saying, oh, it's natural to be aggressive or violent or whatever, that's not true. And then if somebody says it's natural to forgive and to love, and that's not true. <laughs> we actually are capable of either one. And we want to live in a way, we want a society where our survival depends on getting along with people, right? You can set up a society where people are taught to think that the only way they can survive is to beat out somebody else or to kill somebody else. But you need to work on creating a society where that's not true and then you don't tell people that because that can that just makes it true. That makes it a lot harder to establish cooperation. But obviously, if you can create a society where people actually thrive better by getting along, then they will. And that's an upward spiral, right? They do it and it works and they do it again and it works. Um, yeah, so survival of the fittest as competitive and adversarial is too simplistic. It's, and I think in our society now, where we have so much specialization, 
all of us really depend on everybody else, right? I can't fix my own car. I can't grow my own food. I can't heat my house. I can do just about nothing, right? I can, every once in a while, I can fix my glasses or something. That's about it. So I depend on everybody to do their job well and to chart, you know, to have a quality work, to a reasonable price. Uh, the thing is, it's going to break again. I didn't get cheated, you know, I didn't get overcharged. We all depend on each other for everything. Um, in the past, fear of retaliation was a motivator, right? It was more primitive. But now we have the rule of law and we have very complicated social and political systems. And so um, we cooperate. Then he says we're cooperative creatures, right? When we start beating up on each other, it de degenerates, it's self-destructive. So he says, without thinking about it, we cooperate. We tolerate mistakes. We forgive people. And he had this little seven-year-old and he's, he just explained how, you know, the kid will do stuff. He'll break stuff. He'll run into stuff. But you just forgive them right away. You don't get mad at them. Um, so small injustices. Remember the virtue of Aristotle, sociability? Um, so Aristotle's virtues show the high level of social and political life. Um, OK, the Oklahoma bombing, the death penalty. Now, I guess I want to ask each of you, what did you come with before class? Um, Jack, did you read this one? I think you said you did, right? I think I read this one. It's on revenge and forgiveness? Yeah. Um, I thought it was um, interesting that um, it says um, that forgiveness is the better option and that revenge is a cycle that it never that revenge will never end a conflict you think it's true yeah okay but i mean it's easier said than done to do that to just forgive Right, like and then the Sermon on the Mount. So remember the Sermon on the Mount last time? Mm. Jesus said that. So he wasn't, Jesus wasn't so stupid. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. What were you saying? Anything else? Um, uh, I thought it was interesting how it mentioned the Israel-Palestine conflict about um, cycles of revenge. Yeah. Do you know the story behind that very much? I don't know why it started. It's really bad. Um, but there were a lot of people that didn't want to establish Israel after World War II because they knew that this was going to happen. Um, because the Jews were then allowed to go and push the Palestinians off land that their families had had for 800 years, you know. And so that was not going to go over well. <laughs> um, but they did it. The, Brit the British, I think, the Westerners just decided, you know, we're, we're going to decide. It's colonialism. Yeah. And uh, it still, I'll tell you, when I was in Indonesia, all over the world, every Muslim is mad at America for supporting Israel. And uh, Americans just are not aware of how much bad blood we create in our relationship to Israel. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean Israel is totally wrong, but we just, for example, we allow them to come and order $4 billion worth of weapons every year from us. <laughs> Okay, they have so many nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, they, but, but Iran can't even get one, right? Mm. Uh, the more you know about it, the really 
worse it gets. Um, anyway, it's very hard, but until we find some solution, it just keeps going down the rabbit hole, right? Yeah. And it keeps causing a lot of animosity. It really fuels Islamic extremism a lot more than most Americans know. Um, anything else, Jack? That was all. Okay. Um, Alex? I didn't read this one. Okay. Um, Melanie? Um, well, if we're talking about the death penalty, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't like the death penalty. Um, and it's not, I mean, I don't like, I don't think you should kill someone. Um, I don't think killing another person is the answer to stopping crimes, but I think that making someone sit with that, um, like guilt maybe is better than killing them. I feel like if you just kill someone, they don't even get to understand that what they did was wrong. I think if they can sit with that guilt and maybe one day understand or feel some type of remorse, that's a better option. Okay. Um, also the emphasis then gets on um, the government. <laughs> you know, it just becomes so politicized. If you do the death, do you understand that, Melanie? Oh yeah, every everything gets politicized. <laughs> right, but if but if it was just life without parole, it wouldn't be politicized anymore, right? It would just be you killed somebody, you go to prison, and and it's cheaper. Did you know that it's cost? Capital punishment is over twice as expensive. Doesn't save money. It always discriminates based on class, race. Um, it varies so much from state to state. And then um, it doesn't deter, right? There's no evidence that it, anybody else who is going to kill somebody would not kill them because, oh, the death penalty. I mean, a person who's gonna kill someone <laughs> is not stopping to think about stuff. Um, so, I don't really understand why anybody thinks it's good policy. I especially don't understand why they think it's Christian because straight out in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says to forgive. So I don't get that at all. Um, does that make sense to you, Melanie? Yes, it does. So in general, I do think you should run your society and try to make it as spiritual as possible. And so just putting someone in prison and letting them think about it makes it spiritual, right? It's mental, you know, it's in their mind, it's in their head. It's what they have to live with. So know thyself, right? And also the last thing is that if you really are Christian, you also believe people can always change, right? They can convert. So for us to kill them and not give them a chance to convert just seems on, on a Christian, you know, bunch of a Christian beliefs, that doesn't, it doesn't fit at all. So whether or not you believe in all the Christian stuff, does you know, isn't the point. The point is, if you do, this makes absolutely no sense. Does that, does that make sense, Melanie? Yes. Okay, so let me go through a few things here that are important, which is one of the reasons that Bud Welch um, could be forgiving, and this is important, is that he could trust that Tim McVeigh was going to get life without parole. So there was a social system in place. He had been, you know, arrested. So let me see, let, let's get down to that. Um, it has to do with the virtue of dealing with anger, um, the ability to forgive, and then um, trying to overcome this thing, tribalism, right? 
where there's a double standard between us and them, um, the rule of law is important. So um, he decided that killing one more person doesn't solve it. And McVeigh's motive was also revenge. I don't remember what he was taking revenge for, but um, another point that I want you to know is that most bullying in the schools or most shootings, school shootings are because the kid had been bullied, all right? And he's taking revenge. So, all right. Um, so with the death penalty, we need a change of heart. And that's what Jesus was about, you know, a change of heart. Um, if the public wants revenge, politicians will appeal to it and make it worse, right? So you're letting yourself get manipulated by wicked politicians. Um, and so the politicians will blame the public, right? I can't help it. I have to go here and promote the death penalty because that's what people want. And then the public will blame the politicians for manipulating them, right? And not trying to reason with them. And it gets more polarized. But key here is you can't forgive in a vacuum. There's factors that enable people to forgive. First of all, you have to be uh, convinced that he won't get out of prison. He won't harm anybody again. Um, and that the rule of law pr provides safety, right? It replaces blood revenge. Revenge is the cause behind a huge percentage of school shootings. Um, the antagonist is likely to have value for um, for human well-being in the future, right? If you if you give people a chance to think it through and to decide that we need each other and we value each other and we make horrible mistakes, but it's better to forgive and move on and grow right? We also can grow. It's a capacity we have, right? But if we, you know, demonize people, kill people, take revenge, then it just goes south. Um, I had a student who, who wrote some papers about Africa. And I'm telling you that, I mean, if you want to talk about a revenge, situation. It's the same, actually, I had a student from Vietnam, no, from Cambodia, and her parents were recruited into the military as child soldiers, and they killed people, right? The same thing happened in Uganda. These uh, kids went and killed their relatives, their fellow villagers, and so how are you going to reconcile that? And um, the way they do it is, first of all, like the UN or some, someone outside of the country will come in. But the only way that really works is if you provide an opportunity for the people to talk to each other and then to realize, especially he said, you appeal to the mothers of young children because they do not want this to keep happening, right? They get, the guys should get over it because we don't want the next generation. So they will be willing to sit down, talk and compromise. Um, that reflective consciousness, that's what Socrates to me, Plato's character, he's a character that embodies that capacity for reflective consciousness. And if it's because we have that, that life isn't totally desperate, right? If we didn't have that ability to step back, we definitely have awareness of vulnerability, fear, pleasure, and we would just be at each other all the time, right? We would be constantly destroying ourselves and each other. 
It's that capacity we have. And that's why I went into philosophy. I think philosophy represents that. Every, I mean, every, many other aspects of life include it, but I think philosophy is supposed to be kind of the discipline that that's what the discipline is about. Um, it's, it's biologically healthier to apologize. Um, and over time, we're learning to control our aggression because our societies are getting more and more complex and we're more and more aware of how much we depend on each other. Um, so religion, right? Religion can be used as a weapon or it can be used to reconcile people with each other. Um, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, let's see, the Beatitudes. That's what we were covering last time was, um, anyway. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. So let me ask you if you have any other comments on that. And then we'll go back to Aristotle's, the stuff we did last time. Um, any other final comments on this, Jack? No? Um, Alex? Melanie? Um, no, just what we were talking about before class, um, like with comparing um, Jesus and Socrates. Um, I just think that, you know, Jesus and Christianity itself holds a lot more weight just as a label than um, like Socrates would because with Jesus and Christianity, there is like a solid foundation that you can believe in. And with Socrates, he's kind of saying, look, we don't need to follow that higher power you know, we can change things ourselves. Yeah, but the problem is uh, our founding fathers wanted people to be more self-reflective and self-correcting because in Europe, that's what they had. People just believed in and Christianity was used as a weapon, right? To weaponize, Jeez. like the Protestants versus the Catholics. And I mean, the Catholic Church, when it was all powerful, it created a whole lot of trouble, <laughs> right? So it's somewhat worrisome if the majority of Americans uh, have an anti-intellectual religion and they don't engage in that reflective consciousness because you can't have a democracy unless you do. Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes, that makes sense. And that is what, what Lyon College catalog, you know, patients with complexity and ambiguity. Those are really good qualities, you know, and they're really hard. Fairness to opposing points of view. But if we don't, if we don't as a nation work on this, you know, your lives are going to be miserable, <laughs> right? Really, it's non-trivial. I wish, I wish your lives aren't on the brink of being really miserable. But, and it's my fault, my generation's fault for passing on such a terrible situation. Um, but all I can say to you is try not to make it worse, <laughs> which is possible, right? Okay, so let's go back here and let's look at the insights from the wisdom traditions, right? So Jesus Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Melanie wasn't here, but let's just go the Beatitudes. And then I, I just asked last time, is this how Americans act? Blessed are the those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Do Americans honor the meek and say, you will inherit the earth? Uh, blessed are the merciful. Do Americans, are they merciful? Do they have a reputation for being merciful? What about blessed are the pure in heart? Blessed are the peacemakers, right? Uh, I don't think that's how we come across, <laughs> right? Now, maybe the media is wrong. I can understand, but I don't think that's the way we're coming across. Um, Jesus 
is just saying there were all sorts of rules and laws, right, to pass like Melanie and all sorts of doctrines you're supposed to believe in. And the Pharisees were self-righteous, right? And they were condemning people if they didn't follow all the rules. And Jesus said, look, forget it. It's love God, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Not everything else is just distraction. And he does call them a bunch of hypocrites too. Okay, murder. He says, you sh this is the Old Testament. You shall not murder. But I say, you know, being angry with your brother is bad. So don't be angry, right? Is that how Americans are? They're never angry. Adultery. Don't commit it. But I tell you, even if you look lustfully at a woman, you're committing adultery in your heart. Is that true of Americans? They don't look lustfully at women, right? You should, if your eye, you know, if your eyes cause you to sin, you should gouge them out. Is that what Americans do? Um, divorce. If you divorce, uh, anyone who divorces except for sexual immor immorality uh, makes her the victim of adultery, right? Uh, anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Is that the way Americans act? Do they quote the Bible when they decide whether to divorce or not? Um, don't break your oath. Don't eye for an eye, right? Uh, don't resist evil. If somebody uh, slaps you on the cheek, turn them the other cheek. If anybody wants to take your shirt, give them your cloak. Is that how Americans act? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, give to the needy, but do it without talking about it. Pray, but pray in secret, fast, but don't tell anybody. Uh, store up treasures in heaven. Don't worry about food and clothing and money. Don't be anxious about money. Uh, don't judge other people. <laughs> I don't know, Melanie and Alex, do you think this is how Americans are? No. But they but they're supposedly talk about how Christian they are, right? Um, what about you, Melanie? Oh no, I people don't act like that. Um I think it's just the label, honestly. I mean, I think um, you know, people really do worship Jesus and try to try to be um the person you're supposed to be but I don't know no one can cover all of those things and live a, a life I guess okay so the other thing about it is is that if the rest of the world sees us as big hypocrites nobody's going to want to be Christian right right that if you care about the religion you should just do what it says and not worry about trying to convert other people because if all you worry about is the power of having control over another person and converting them you're going to end up with fewer you know fewer christians than you would it doesn't work um all right so let's go back to aristotle's virtues then and um, okay, so Alex and Melanie, this was the assignment for last time. Did you read the stuff for last time? Um, yes, I did. Okay, good. And did you answer one of two of these questions? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> okay, what about you, Melanie? Um, I haven't read over it yet, but I'm sure I could look at, at the questions and answer one of them. Sure. Um, and Alex, you probably could too. An yeah. example of a person of high moral standards. Uh, some people that are famous for certain character traits, the virtues or the vices. Bill Gates is now famous for his generosity. Um, Aristotle claims that actions are virtuous. 
Do you know somebody who performs an act that appears virtuous, but they have an ulterior motive, right? They want status or they want something else, and that's why they're acting that way. Okay, so Melanie, can you think of examples of any of those three? Um, yes, so the first one, um, high, mor high moral standards. I think this is, we got a new coach this year for softball, and um, our, I, I guess our um, softball hasn't been the best environment over the last few years. Um, and so I guess just her coming in was just kind of like a shock, you know, she holds us to a lot higher standards than we've experienced in the past. Um, and she just expects a lot of us, like um, just stuff like getting to practice on time. You know, if we don't get there at a certain time, we just get kicked out, we don't get to practice. Um, and we have a lot of rules this year as far as like tobacco goes and alcohol and, you know, things like that. Okay, but she also has a heart, right? Oh yeah, she she knows when um, she's being a little too hard on us and she'll take a step back and tell us, hey, you're still doing a good job, but I'm doing this because I believe in you. Okay. Yeah, actually, I there was no sports when I was in um, high school. Uh, Title IX got passed when I was a senior, so I never was involved with all this stuff. Um, but my son, my children were, and so I knew how much of character development or character formation, for better or worse, goes on in athletic teams. Um, but I didn't know that before. And it, it is sad to me that coaches get paid so much less. I don't know how much less, but less than professors because they, you know, they make a huge contribution. Um, you know, when we have these big degrees and stuff, and partly we have them because of privilege. We didn't have to make a lot of money um, early on, so we could, you know, stay in school. But anyway, um, that's nice, nice to hear that, because I know about the softball. Everybody knows if some team, some coach goes south, you know, the rumors get around. Um, what about you, Alex? Can you answer any of those three? So I wanted to answer um, the third one where uh, Aristotle claims that actions are virtuous only if the people choosing the actions know what they are doing, choose it for its own sake, and are, and are acting from a firm and unchangeable character. Um, one example I could think of is not exactly a person, but uh like a not a program it's it was like a non-profit uh do you remember it, it's still a thing like um you know how there's that like the loop for um like breast cancer there's that little loop but i forgot what color maybe blue i don't know not but for autism oh yeah i remember that there was a big like like um, wave to like basically boycott that little nonprofit because they did not actually use the donations that they got into research for like um, into research for autism. Um, it went into the pockets of uh, the the leaders of the nonprofit, it, and it was a big organization. So there was a wave to change that symbol into other things which were led by people who actually care and people who are actually autistic yeah, yeah. those things happen corruption right um so uh here's the what i want you to think about is that his view is both natural and spiritual aristotle but do you think it's possible to combine Christianity with Aristotle, right? The mainline ch churches, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Methodist, and Catholic, they unite 
Aristotle with Christianity, and they unite reason with faith. Uh, they accept evolution. But other churches disagree, right? And so the question is, what do you think, right? Where do you stand? If you disagree, you can still give examples about how Aristotle's view is the same as, for example, Christianity's seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins are lust, that's Aristotle's temperance, greed, that's Aristotle's generosity, sloth, that would be Aristotle's flourishing, right? Envy would be an extreme, right? Pride is definitely, Aristotle would say, overstepping your bounds, uh, over, uh, let's see, thinking you know more than you know, thinking you're more powerful than you are. Um, anger, again, was an Aristotelian vice. Gluttony is an Aristotelian vice, right? And also Socrates, right? He had those virtues. So even if your official church you go to um, doesn't officially accept Aristotle or evolution, it might there might be a lot of similarities and a lot of agreement. Um, so what, what do you think? Do you think it matters if somebody acts virtuously because it's what they think of as natural and necessary? Or do they have to do it because they're following Christ or Buddha or Muhammad? Um, does that make the actions different? And are those ulterior motives or what? What do you think, um, Melanie? Um, I think it is very much possible for someone to just do that because it's what's right. Um, I think everyone can do that. But I think Christian or, you know, following a religion does give an ulterior motive to it um just because in the end you'll be saved but, yeah <laughs> but yeah I, I don't know yeah I mean that's true you could there are certain people that probably think all of religion is at least tainted because of that ul ulterior motive right salvation or damnation you're not really doing it for its own sake so you aren't really virtuous um does that make sense to you, Melanie? I mean, it's one thing makes sense. Another thing, do you agree or not, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, what about you, Alex? Um, okay, so I think that there are two different parts. There are two different... Sorry, my dog. <laughs> um, there are two different parts to it where... Um, uh, w to religion where they follow religion or they they do the things because of religion because um when they think god or jesus is a good person and they want to emulate that they want to be like them so they they choose the actions that they believe would be like what they would do um what 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 jesus would do without the please wait I'm sorry. Um, without, without, um, sorry, uh, without, um, ulterior motive, without the t ulterior motive or without the mindset of I'm doing this because I want to go to heaven. And then the other part is like, I want, I want to do this because I want to go to heaven, not because of like, this is what God would do. They would think this is what God would want me to do. Or like, this is what, will give me the good points. So I think there are people who want to be, want to act like Jesus. They want to be the good in the world. They want to like be an extension of him, but there are others who have an ulterior motive. Right. Does it have to be Jesus? That's all, there are lots of good people in the world. Yeah, <laughs> but it, to be strongly connected to like, christianity or religion um but i guess like would people who follow religion very strictly 
they would more likely look up to Jesus or their priest or such. What about if someone is a humanist and they, they adapt all those virtues, but just for its own sake, right? Without any, is that a more evolved level of virtue or it doesn't matter either way? I'll just leave that and I'll just ask Jack because we're running out of time. What's the question again? Well, no, I mean, what did you think about? Okay, so we've got these relig religions that tie Aristotle's virtues with Christianity and also with evolution. Then we have these other denominations that don't. But then the key is you can tie Aristotle's virtues to the seven deadly sins of Christianity, right? And so how opposed are these two views or how connected do you think they are? And do you think religion always includes, it's tainted because it includes ulterior motives? What do you think? Um, I think it is tainted a little bit because of the ulterior motive, but I, I still think it, it's still being virtuous is good. Okay, what about polarization? I really ought to ask this at the end of every class. You know, how are we gonna overcome polarization? Well, one thing would be to focus on the humanistic values, right? And to call them um, Christian, call them Christian if you want to, but not everybody in America is a Christian. So you could, um, they, they could build a bridge between people so that they don't, polarized so much so I know Jack you think it's it's hopeless we'll just get used to it but I don't think you're gonna like adult life very much I mean it might sound like we'll get used to it but I don't I don't think it's gonna be pretty if you let polarization keep going does that make sense yes ma'am and it isn't and I'm sorry that it's this way, I don't, but I do think we need to keep working on it because human beings have destroyed themselves many times, you know? Self-destruction is not out of the realm of possibility. Um, and polarization is the way it starts because if you can hype up how awful these other people are, you will start doing things that are self-destructive. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Because it just gets to be a revenge food fight, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, next time you have depression and you have um, uh, stress. So check out the articles and I will send you all the information. And if you want an office hour, contact me. I have the office hours in the evening. But if that's not convenient for you, it's no problem. I just have them then because they're easier to remember if it's their same time as the class. But other than that, hang in there and um, good luck. And I don't know what happened to Mia. So we'll see you.